Θέλουμε λοιπόν σήμερα όλους να σας ευχαριστήσουμε για την συμμετοχή σας στην απόψηνή μας εκδήλωση, η οποία γίνεται με συνεργασία του οίκου Λουμένης, όπου η New Optical είναι αποκλειστικός αντιπρόσωπος στην Ελλάδα. Και είναι μεγάλη μας χαρά γιατί από πολύ μακριά, σήμερα το πρωί, από μια μεγάλη υπεραντλητική πτήση, ερχόμενος από το Νάσφιλ Τένεσή, διαμέσου Νέας Υόρκης, Ήρθε ο αγαπητός και διαγεκριμένος σε όλους γνωστός γιατρός ε, Dr. Ρόναντο Κτόγιος, ο οποίος είναι ο developer του IPL και ειδικό στην ξεοφθαλμία για το μηχάνημα το οποίο σήμερα, το σύστημα μάλλον το οποίο σήμερα θα μας αναλύσει, το Optima IPL M22. At this time, I'd like to welcome all of you that you came here tonight to be with us in this uh, special night organized by New Optical Solutions with uh, Lumenis. And uh, especially we have a, a very good uh, guest that comes from uh, across the Atlantic, from Nashville, Tennessee, a good friend, Dr. Rolando Togios, that he is the developer of, of IPL. And he has to say many, many things to you about this uh, amazing uh, machine, the Optum IPL M M22. At this point, I'd like to call upon Dr. Χρήσα Τερζίδου. Θα παρακαλέσω να έρθει η κυρία Τερζίδου στο βήμα πριν ξεκινήσουμε, εκ μέρου τη Οφθαλμολογική Ιατρική Κοινότητα. Mrs. Τερζίδου is the president of the Hellenic Ocular Surface Dry Eye Society and director of the Clinical Ophthalmology Department of the Constantopoulio Hospital. Θα παρακαλέσω την κυρία Τερζίδου, η οποία μάλιστα οργανώνει φέτο και το πρώτο συνέδριο το Νοέμβριο, θα μα πει την οποία τη ιδιαίτερως ευχαριστώ για την πολύτιμη βοήθειά της και την αγάπη της όλων των ιατρών της ομάδας της από το Κωνσταντοπούλιο να δώσει ένα χαιρετισμό στο γιατρό εκ μέρους των ιατρών οφθαλμιάτων. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Δεν θα σας κουράσω. Ε, δύο λόγια μόνο που όλοι γνωρίζουμε πόσο πολύ μας ταλαιπωρεί η ξηροφθαλμία στα ιατρία και δεν βρίσκουμε πάντα τις λύσεις ότι τα τελευταία χρόνια έχουμε πάρα πολλά βήματα έχουμε κάνει από την έρευνα και την βασική αλλά και την κλινική στο πώς να τη, το πώς, το πού οφείλεται, πώς να τη διαχωρίσουμε, πώς να την καταλάβουμε στην καθημερινή μας πρακτική. Αλλά λιγότερα πράγματα μπορούμε να πούμε ότι είμαστε ευτυχείς και ευχαριστημένοι ότι φτάνουμε σε ένα αποτέλεσμα, ιδίω στην ομάδα των ασθενειών, η οποία λέγεται ε, ανεπάρκεια με υπομιανών αδένων. Εδώ λοιπόν έχει τη τεχνολογία, έρχονται τα καινούργια μηχανήματα, τα οποία έχουμε δοκιμάσει στην κλινική και είμαστε υποχρεωμένοι να τα δοκιμάζουμε για να έχουμε και την δικιά μας εμπειρία, γιατί έχουμε το ειδικό ιατρείο που ασχολείται με αυτά. Έτσι έχουμε δοκιμάσει και αυτό το ωραίο μηχάνημα, το IPL. Και για αυτό το λόγο το σας προλογίζω σήμερα και να σας υπενθυμίσω ότι το συνέδριο όμως που θα γίνει είναι το πρώτο συνέδριο που θα αναφερθεί σε όλα αυτά τα θέματα που μας βασανίζουν στην, σαν οφθαλμιάτρους. Ευχαριστούμε την γιατρό την κυρία Χρήσα Τερζίδου και στη συνέχεια θα ήθελα να καλέσω τον Διευθυντή Πολίσεων της Λουμένης για την Ευρώπη και μέσα Ανατολή τον κύριο Πάρη Χάτζη Ασανσιάδη ο οποίος είναι κοντά μας, εκ μέρους της Λουμένης πάντα, στην εταιρεία μας και πραγματικά κάνει το καλύτερο δυνατό. Τον ευχαριστώ ιδιαίτερος και τον παρακαλώ να έρθει στο βήμα για να σας παρουσιάσει το γιατρό μας και special guest σήμερα. Καλησπέρα. Ε, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για τον χρόνο που μας αφιερώνετε σήμερα. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω και τη New Optical που μας φιλοξενεί ε, και τον επίτιμο προσκαλυμμένο μας, τον κύριο Ρολάντο Τόιος. Ε, είναι μεγάλη μας χαρά που μπορούμε και παρουσιάζουμε την καινούργια τεχνολογία και στην Ελλάδα. Το Optima IPL είναι ένα μηχάνημα το οποίο πρωτοβγήκε πριν 20 χρόνια α, περίπου στην πρώτη του μορφή. Αυτό είναι το 6th generation τώρα του μηχανήματος αυτού, με πολλά iterations που έχουν γίνει και βελτιώσεις. Είναι μια προσπάθεια που δουλεύουμε μαζί με τον Dr. Orlando Toyos, ο οποίος είναι και όπως ξέρετε καλά ο φευρέτης του IPL για dry eye. Θα σας εξηγήσει ακριβώς ποια είναι τα προτερήματα και γιατί νομίζουμε ότι το μηχάνημα αυτό πλέον είναι το golden standard για την αντιμετώπιση του MGD και του inflammation του dry eye και γιατί πιστεύω ότι είναι ένα μηχάνημα το οποίο θα εξυπηρετήσει πολλούς ασθενείς αλλά και τους γιατρούς στα ιατρία τους. Dr. Orlando Toyos, if you want to come to take the podium. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. This is very exciting for me because 
20 years ago, if uh, you said, let's have a dry eye lecture, probably only one person would show up. Now we have a room full of people that will come uh, see this. I wrote this book, uh, Dry Eye Disease Treatment in the Year 2020. If some of the things that I'm going to be talking about here is in that book, but more of the things that we're doing for dry eyes in that book as well, you can get that at Amazon. What's exciting for me is in all my books, I wind up quoting uh, Hippocrates. Uh, the father of medicine, so now I feel like, now that I'm in Greece, I feel even better uh, uh, about all these quotes that I had. But one of the quotes that he did talk about is that what doctors should do, and this is way back in the beginning, is listen to the patients and try to treat the patients without giving them a ton of medicines. And I think what's happened in dry eye is the first thing that we do is we start putting a whole bunch of drops on the patient instead of trying to treat their actual problem. So what I'm going to be talking about IPL is actually treating the meibomian glands so the meibomian glands work better and getting these patients off drops instead of having them. I get patients that come into our clinic and they have a bag full of drops. I'm sure you guys have this too. And they're putting drops in their eyes all day long, all day long. If Hippocrates saw that, he would go, oh, wait, we've got to stop doing that. We're going to have to do something uh, different. So my practice, so we have practices in Memphis, Nashville, and New York City, and I devote my practice to cataract surgery, LASIK surgery, and dry eye. And one of the things I tell people is if you're going to be the best cataract surgeon you're, uh, you could possibly be, you're going to have to treat dry eye. If you're going to be the best LASIK surgeon you could possibly be, you're going to have to treat dry eye. And dry eye is just so prevalent right now. And if you want these patients to have the best vision with surgeries that you're doing, you're going to have to treat their dry eye. The most frustrating thing is doing a perfect surgery. Patient comes in and the reason why they're not seeing is because they're dry eye. And now we're getting more doctors looking at these patients before surgery, diagnosing them with dry eye and wanting to do something to treat them uh, for their dry eye. The other thing is if you see a lot of reports now, We've always known that LASIK can cause some dry eye, usually it's you know, last about three months, but now we're finding that even cataract surgery, patients that don't have any dry eye whatsoever, there's a paper out of the Philippines that show 15% of patients who have cataract surgery who don't have any signs of dry eye whatsoever will have dry eye that can last anywhere from three months to six months. So again, you're going to need something to treat these patients. Dry eye is growing. I can't tell you how many young people now are coming in uh, with dry eye. And why is that happening? Well, the diet, our diet all over the world in the last 40 years has really changed. One is it's gone to, instead of uh, food that we directly get to processed food. Uh, the other thing is we've gone away from a plant-based diet to more of a meat-based uh, diet. All these things are more inflammatory. And then, I've got three teenage daughters. If you, if all day long I see my daughters either doing this, or on the computer, or doing this, or watching Netflix, or whatever, and they're not blinking as much as they were blinking before. And with patients with MGD, if you're not blinking, you're not secreting those mybum substances from the meibomian glands. So that's leading to more dry eyes. So I got 14-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and it's just increasing. So most of the patients that are showing up, if you were to ask, uh, showing up in your practice, have some form of dry eye uh, that we have to treat. So I think it's the number one cause of patients coming into a clinic at this point. So the type of uh, dry eye that we mostly see is uh, meibomian gland dysfunction. And here you see the meibomian glands. I tell patients we've got about 20 to 30 meibomian glands in the upper uh, and lower lids. The thing about the meibomian gland anatomy, and it's going to become important when we talk more about intense pulse light, I tell people your meibomian gland is different than most glands. It's a test tube. Our meibomian glands aren't like normal glands that another gland is feeding into. Like for example, the lacrimal gland feeds into glands that uh, secrete. It's a, it's a test tube. So when you get secretions that are not normal, not like olive oil-like secretions, those secretions will sink to the bottom of the test tube. And I'm going to show you some slides earlier, uh, later to show you what happens to the meibomian gland when you don't get proper secretions 
when you get more of a toothpaste like secretion is that toothpaste will uh, accumulate in this uh, test tube and finally block that meibomian gland and uh, give you meibomian gland dropout. So it produces the olive oil, the fatty layer of the tear, that's what keeps the tear from evaporating. I know you know all this, I'm just going over it as a quick review. One thing you may not know is I tell people this is a skin gland condition. So the first thing we do as eye doctors is we look straight at the eye. What we should be doing is we should be looking at their uh, skin, we should be looking at their glands, and then we look at their eye. So now that I've been doing this for over 22 years uh, and working in dry eye, I actually, when I walk in the room, I can start diagnosing patients just by the way their face looks. So a patient with rosacea, you will see on the epidermis, they'll have those talangiectasias, uh, or you see a patient that has some acne, or acne rosacea, or any kind of skin condition, you know that they're gonna have some meibomian gland dysfunction. About 80% of patients who have uh, rosacea will have meibomian gland dysfunction uh, and dry eye. Now the inflammatory mediators, it turns out that these patients that have these facial uh, type problems like acne or rosacea, they're making inflammatory mediators. And these inflammatory mediators, not only are they breaking down the skin, uh, but they're breaking down uh, the meibomian gland, so their meibomian glands don't work well. The inflammatory mediator that I want you to look at is, this is a very important one, interleukin-17. So I'm asked uh, all the time is, what is the most specific inflammatory mediator uh, in dry eye? So if we could have one quick test that we could do in the office, the inflammatory mediator that's most important in dry eye is interleukin-17. Why is it so important? Actually, interleukin-17 is made by a T helper cell. So if you look at all the drops that we have today in dry eye, whether it's Restasis, Cyclosporin, or Lefitogras, they all are T-cell mediators. So the reason why steroid and a non-steroidal can work sometimes on a patient is because it decreases prostaglandins, but that's not actually the inflammatory we want to decrease. The inflammatory mediator we want to decrease is interleukin-17. So we actually did a study in combination with some Chinese surgeons looking at the amount of interleukin-17 in dry eye patients and how IPL with the luminous optima can decrease the amount of interleukin-17. The other thing that's important with these patients with rosacea, I ask all the time, uh, why are you treating from ear to ear? It turns out these patients with like a rosacea type problem is the talangiectasias are actually coming from the ear and actually coming around into where the lid margin is. And then even there's uh, uh, talangiectasias that are coming from the nose over to the meibomian glands. So if you were to just treat the lid, uh, what happens is those blood vessels can come back uh, much faster and you haven't decreased the inflammation. The other thing, uh, and we'll look at this when we're looking at Demodex, I know that's a big topic right now that you have Demodex on your eyelash margins, but did you know that you have Demodex all over your face? And where Demodex likes to go, it likes to go to the hair follicles because the two things that uh, Demodex like is oil and they like dead skin. That's what they feed off of. And I'm actually going to show you videos of Demodex uh, eating. So, if you're about to go get dinner, this is probably not the video you want to see before you, before you go eat. But, so, if you were to just treat the lid margins, or if you do tea tree oil just on the uh, eyelash margins, yeah, you may get rid of some Demodex, but what happens is the Demodex will just come back to the, the hair follicles. You have to do something to treat the Demodex of the face, or else you're, you're going to be spinning your wheels, and that's why people don't get treated for Demodex. Do you know that there's four to six babies in every Demodex uh, that you have? So if you just leave one alive, there's going to be six after uh, a couple of days. And then that's why these uh, Demodex multiply, and that's why you need to treat uh, the whole face. So how did this all start? So uh, in our clinic, we actually have ophthalmology and we have aesthetics, so we have a full aesthetics clinic. We just had a meeting uh, this week, we have it every year, we're going to have two next year where it's a dry eye and aesthetics meeting and uh, it was such a packed house 
of uh, doctors wanting to learn how to do some aesthetics. And this is how I learned about uh, IPL. So I had my aesthetics clinic and I had my general ophthalmology practice. And I was doing CO2 laser and I was doing Botox and I was doing filler. But I was also doing IPL uh, for rosacea patients. So I had patients that would come in with, these, with this red face and telangiectasias. Uh, you see these uh, patients and they've got these, uh, had these patients come into our uh, clinic and they had bad rosacea and telangiectasias. And so what I would do is I would treat them with IPL. So way back in 2000, uh, Luminous had the first uh, IPL system and what we were using it for was to treat rosacea. And so these patients would come in, they would be treated for their rosacea with IPL, their skin would look better, but then I had a couple of patients tell me that their dry eye was better. So we started looking at the eyelid margin and then we started our study. So the first paper that we ever wrote was in 2003, doing a case study showing that IPL was effective in treating patients uh, with dry eye. And then that started us on a whole seven year research on trying to figure out how we could use IPL uh, for dry eye. So in that time, we were just treating patients for free and just trying to figure out, the things that we were trying to figure out were energy levels, protocol, where to treat. So things that uh, I learned in those years is, do we wanna treat ear to ear? Or do we wanna treat just the lids? Or do we wanna treat face? Do we want to do one pass, or do we want to do two passes, or do we want to do three passes, or do we want to do four passes? Uh, what are the limitations of the technology at the time, and what changes to the technology do I have now that make it more effective? So when I was doing dry eye with IPL way back in 2001, I would say about 20% of patients uh, would get better uh, as we were learning this. By about 2007, we were about 60 to 70%. And I'll explain to you why this is important. Now we're about at 97%. And the reason is, is that the technology has evolved over the years to make it possible for us to effectively use it for dry eye. Right now, you see a whole bunch of IPL systems out. They're all like first generation IPL systems. And I'll explain to you a first generation IPL system versus what you have here with the Luminous. But one of the things that we found out is that the further you treat away from the lid margin, the less effective your treatment is. So what you really wanna do when you're treating these patients with IPL to be very effective is get right on the lid margin. Now the lid margin is the thinnest skin of the whole body. And the problem with IPL on thin skin is that you can uh, burn the skin. So how Luminous and uh, we'll show you the technology um, later and you get to play with it. How we've been able to, be, to treat these patients at that thin skin of the lid margin is one, put a chiller, and this chiller is fluid distilled water going through that's being cooled so that you don't burn the skin when you're doing IPL around the lid margin. Then being able to pulse that energy, so the first IPL system was just big, one big flash of light and what we found is if we can actually pulse that energy, we could give the skin a time to do some thermal relaxation where it cools a little bit so that you can give it another burst of energy and another burst of energy. And then consistent energy. So if you program 10 joules, you get 10 joules. Not that you program 10 and you might get nine and you might get eight, because what happens in these first generation IPL systems is as the more you use it, the energy level goes down and down and down. So you can actually get a brand new first generation IPL system and it would work really well, but then as you use it, it works less well, less well, less well, because the energy that it's producing is less and less. It's not a consistent energy. So here I am, I'm giving IPL to uh, an optometrist who has uh, dry eye. And he was telling me that he really couldn't do his job effectively because all day he's on the microscope looking at patients at the slit lamp and his eye would dry out more and more as the day goes on. Uh, and the type of meibomian gland dysfunction that you'll see looking at the slit lamp, these patients with thickened lid margins, 
you see that they start growing bacteria. So this is the kind of stuff that Demodex love, this dead skin cell. Uh, you see scurf, collarettes. You actually start to lose eyelash margin, uh, eyelashes as your meibomian gland dysfunction gets worse. You get these inspissated glands with toothpaste-like secretions coming, and then you get these talonjectasia. So we get several patients that I tell them they have rosacea, and they say, I don't have rosacea. And I tell them, look, I'm looking at the thinnest skin. Yes, you do have rosacea. I'm seeing these talonjectasias on this thin skin. So what happens to the skin is after the age of 28, you don't make any more elastin and collagen. That's why you know, we start to get a little bit older and the skin starts to sag. So, but the epidermis gets thinner. So why don't we see rosacea at 28 and then all of a sudden at 45, a patient miraculously gets rosacea? It's because their epidermis is getting thinner and thinner. You can start seeing these talonjectasias. But what I uh, tell you is if you see these talonjectasias on these patients at 18, 19, 20, if they don't start doing something about this, uh, then you're going to have a problem with their dry eye in their 30s, 40s as they get uh, older. And then they'll go, oh, yeah, I do have rosacea. So what is IPL? So it's not a laser. It's actually a xenon flash lamp. So if you remember your chemistry, xenon is one of the stable gases, one of the noble gases. So it's got uh, the perfect amount of electrons in its outer shell. If you put electricity into this gas, what happens, it becomes unstable. But it's such a stable gas, when it gets stability again, it releases a wave, wavelengths of light. The light it releases anywhere from 400 nanometers all the way up to infrared. Uh, about 800, 850 nanometers. What we're doing is we're putting a special filter to block out all those wavelengths that we don't want and allow the wavelengths that we do want uh, to come in. And then, like I said, with this thin skin of the lid margin, you want to pulse that energy so you don't burn that skin and you get enough energy to stimulate the meibomian glands. So what is the perfect energy in terms of stimulating meibomian glands? It's actually red. So we've actually studied this. We've actually studied what uh, wavelengths of light stimulate meibomian gland function. It's 600 to 700 nanometers. It is the red uh, wavelength, which is good because red actually also closes off talonjectasia. So when you're treating these patients for dry eye, not only are you stimulating the meibomian glands, but you're also closing off talonjectasias and helping their rosacea. So you have manufacturers now with first generation IPL systems saying, oh, we put in a 540 filter. Well, a 540 filter is allowing wavelengths of light that can be harmful to the skin and burn the skin from 540 to 600. And then you have other manufacturers saying, well, we use a 640 filter. If you use a 640 filter, you're missing out on some of the red that will give you uh, stimulation of the meibomian glands. So what we have is a 590 filter uh, in the, and you have choices of changing the filters, but at a 590 filter, you're getting all that red wavelength of light that you want in terms of meibomian gland dysfunction. So what happens when you put this on the skin, what happens is the light will go from the epidermis into the dermal layer. And I'm going to show you uh, anatomy of where the meibomian gland is. This is where you want the energy. You want the energy in the dermis. So anything, like when we do a warm compress, what you're doing is you're putting heat here and you're hoping the heat will penetrate into the dermis to actually melt those secretions. But with IPL, when you're putting it on the epidermis, that wavelength and those wavelengths of light bypass the epidermis and give you some heating here in the dermis. And what that does is it actually opens up the glands and starts to melt those secretions. So that's why you see the videos that I put up of my Bohmian gland expression, because we've actually caused heat in this area to melt these secretions. So it's been shown that you need at least 43 degrees Celsius to be able to actually melt toothpaste-like uh, secretions in the meibomian glands. Very difficult to get 43 degrees uh, into the dermis from a warm compress. And that's why warm compresses really don't work on somebody that has moderate to severe meibomian gland uh, dysfunction. 
I don't even do warm compresses anymore. If, it, if I'm not using a system that doesn't give you 43 degrees Celsius, it's not going to work. Now, you have a, a treatment like LipoFlow that comes from the inside out. That gets to 43 degrees. You have something called the Q, which is my little device. That gets you 43 degrees in the dermis. Um, but the amount of heat that you generate in the dermis with IPL is at least 50 degrees Celsius. So that's why this is the best way to melt secretions in the meibomian gland. So I have patients who you squeeze on their gland and nothing comes out. You do IPL, all of a sudden you see all of this toothpaste-like secretion coming out of the gland. I've actually had patients that have had lipoflow three days before they had IPL. Nothing came out of their glands when they had their lipoflow. You do IPL and everything comes out of their glands. So this is, uh, I'm working with some doctors in China. This is actually video of Demodex. So you see where they like to hang out. They like to hang out around the hair follicles. Uh, there's about five, four to six uh, eggs here. And what we're showing is when you do M22 uh, on these Demodex, you actually kill them. So this is the best way to kill uh, Demodex. So this paper will come out uh, soon. IPL is such a good way to kill bacteria and kill Demodex that we actually now have IPL robots that we stick in a room that, to disinfect operating rooms and disinfect uh, clinic rooms. So what happens is you take this IPL robot, you stick it in a room, close the door, it flashes light throughout the room, kills all microorganisms. So you don't have to go in there and wipe, wipe down uh, surgery suites anymore. Yeah, you show a patient these kind of videos and you tell them this is what's hanging out around your lid margin, they'll, they'll want IPL right away. So I keep saying, you know, stimulating the meibomian glands to work better. So this is a term that you're going to be hearing more and more. Uh, it's already out there, but you're going to be hearing it more and more. It's out there in the other specialties, but photobiomodulation using specific wavelengths of light to actually stimulate uh, cells to work better. We've seen this in plastic surgery using uh, red light to and infrared to actually stimulate the fibroblasts to make more collagen and elastin. Uh, we see it in or orthopedics to help patients heal after surgery faster by using infrared. It's even being used in retina now. So there's a company called Lumathera that they use infrared light to treat patients with age-related macular degeneration. So what we're doing when we're doing IPL with the M22 is we're doing photomodulation and stimulating uh, the cells of the meibomian gland uh, to work better. All right, so you have to have an understanding of light uh, and I'm seeing a lot of people want to get into, a lot of companies want to get into light treatments, but they don't have the basic understanding of light. The reason why we're putting this on the skin is because you get different penetration levels of light. So blue light doesn't really penetrate uh, as far as red light does. And it turns out that red light penetrates right to the meibomian glands, and that may be one of the reasons why red light works so much better than any light. So if you get somebody saying, oh yeah, our wavelength is in the 500s, you don't want 500. And if, you, and if they say our wavelength is infrared or 800s, that's too far. That's penetrating beyond uh, where the meibomian glands are. So it seems red has the best penetration to get where we want to get in the meibomian glands. And then you generate some heat. So this is what I'm talking about. These are patients that we've uh, squeezed their uh, glands and nothing would come out. We do IPL and then all of a sudden the gland opens up and then the secretion melts. Remember you need at least 43 degrees Celsius to melt these secretions. And then you can do expression and get these out. So why do I do expression after every IPL treatment? And one of the reasons why I do that is if we go back to uh, this picture here, if you look at this picture here, if the gland is filled with white toothpaste and you're doing IPL, 
Yes, IPL will get and penetrate right where these glands are, but the thickened toothpaste may stop some of the penetration of light to the back side of the meibomian gland. So essentially you're getting light penetration here, but they've got all this toothpaste-like secretion there. So when I'm doing these expressions, and this is why after each treatment it gets better and better, is if you clear those secretions and you clear the toothpaste-like secretions, you're gonna get more penetration of that light to all the cells of the meibomian gland. The other reason why I do expression is I like to categorize how bad a patient's uh, meibomian gland dysfunction is. If their glands are producing this white, thick, toothpaste-like secretion, that is the most severe form of meibomian gland dysfunction. So if they have dropout, then their uh, glands are dormant, they're not making any kind of secretions whatsoever. If they're making this toothpaste-like secretion, uh, then you know they have severe uh, meibomian gland dysfunction. So what I like to do is express every time and actually categorize what type of secretion is coming out. And I don't do anything more scientific than say either it's toothpaste or as they get better, they'll make more of a yellow type secretion that's softer. So it's more like a butter uh, type secretion. And then finally, after they get several treatments, it turns into olive oil. So I would say this is somebody with moderate uh, meibomian uh, gland dysfunction. And I'm gonna show you how we uh, diagnose these patients beforehand. So we use the Antares uh, topographer to uh, look at the meibomian glands and do meibography. Then we do a treatment and then we figure out what kind of secretions they're making. So IPL isn't a one and done treatment. So anytime you diagnose these patients with dry eye, you have to tell them, look, this is like me diagnosing you with high blood pressure or diabetes. This is something that you're gonna have to work on to make better and it's always gonna be with you. So if you uh, do start on IPL, it usually takes at least four treatments to get these patients to get their meibomian glands working better. That's in about 90% of patients. And then those patients will come in for maintenance treatments. I have some patients that come in once a year for a maintenance treatment, and I have some patients that come in uh, every four months for maintenance treatment. It's just depending on how severe their meibomian gland dysfunction is. And then what do we see uh, on the lid margin when these patients start to get better. So here's a patient that came in, 35 year old, she was having problems wearing her contact lenses. So you see she's got all the signs. So she's losing eyelashes, she's got signs of demodex and uh, uh, bacterial and blepharitis. You see it here and here. You see thickening of the lid margin. You see these talonjectasias. You squeeze on the glands, nothing comes out. Uh, she had some injection of the conjunctiva. This is just after two treatments, and you can see her eyelashes will start to come back. The lid margin is thinner. You start to lose those talonjectasias. You squeeze on the glands, and you can see that uh, normal secretions uh, are starting to come out. So this is another thing that you should categorize in your uh, notes on what's the lid margin look like as they're going through these treatments. All right, so why, what is the mechanism of action for IPL? So we've proven that IPL kills bacteria in Demodex. You get the heat and expression. Uh, it closes off abnormal talonjectasias, and that's what we've been using IPL for for 20-some for years. It decreases the inflammatory mediators on the skin, and I'll talk about that more when I talk about, I've got a special case to show you. And then this photomodulation stimulating the mitochondria cells uh, to work better. Now another uh, topic and another term and another reason why you will see that IPL works for meibomian gland dysfunction is heat shock proteins. So if you give heat to a cell, uh, the cell's response and the DNA response is to make these proteins called heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins actually will protect uh, the DNA of cells so that translocation and translation uh, will happen in a more effective way. So if you heat and don't kill a cell, you'll make these heat shock proteins. There's several heat shock proteins. The one that's uh, been the most studied 
is Heat Shock Protein 70. And it's already been shown that IPL will stimulate the amount of heat shock protein 70 that's produced. So anytime we do any of these lasers, whether it is um, CO2 laser to the skin, fractionated CO2, any kind of heating to the skin will actually stimulate cells in our body and stimulate cells on the face and other parts to actually make these heat shock proteins. That's why somebody who's getting CO2 laser and IPL, they look so much younger than patients that aren't doing these things for their skin because they're doing photobiomodulation and they're producing heat shock proteins. So there's already now several papers. We're, we have about half of them uh, out there. Uh, most of the papers that are out there, I would say 90% involve the M22 and you'll see the best efficacy with the uh, M22. We just published another paper this year. We've got two in the pipeline. So there's gonna be so many papers on IPL. I think there's no question now that people know that IPL works uh, for meibomian gland dysfunction and dry eye. So the things that this system has, and we've already talked about it, but consistent energy level, and I'll show you a, a graphic on that, the chiller tip, and then you can control the amount of energy that you're producing and uh, the amount of pulses, and you can uh, program in thermal re the time of thermal relaxation time. So what I tell people when, when you get this system, you get 20 years of experience, because I've already programmed this IPL system for treatment of dry eye. So there's no guessing, you don't have to figure out anything, and we have thousands of patients. So I, in any given week, I treat about 30 patients with IPL, and we're, I have so many IPL patients that now our optometrists treat them, and now the other doctors in the practice uh, treat these patients. So now everybody and their grandmother is pulling out their IPL system out and saying, oh, we treat uh, dry eye. So yeah. You can say you have an IPL system, but it's saying like you have a phone. So this is a phone and this is a phone. There's no question that this phone is much more advanced than this phone. And that's the, what we're going on with these IPL systems. All these IPL systems are the IPL systems that I used way back in 2001. There's no advanced technology in this. And again, Luminous made the first IPL system, and what they've done is they keep advancing the technology and making it better and better. So if you use some of these first-generation IPL systems, yeah, you might get one or two patients that do well. But if a patient's coming to your office and they're paying good money for you them to be treated with their uh, dry eye disease, uh, you better have effectiveness up to 97%. And the reason why I say that, an ophthalmology is different than any other specialty. When a patient comes in for a LASIK procedure, you say, okay, we're going to do laser and we get rid of those glasses. You know, 99% of the time, we do that. They come in for cataract surgery, we say, hey, we're going to do your cataract surgery and we're going to get your vision better. You know, nine, over 90% of the time, we're getting their vision better. We do successful things in ophthalmology. The worst thing to do would be to bring something into your practice where it's only 10% successful or 20% successful. That's not the realm that we deal in. We're dealing in ultra success, and that's what you should do when you uh, decide on what uh, technology you're going to use. So the older IPL systems, these first generations, they give you a spike in energy. So when you see and come up and see my parameters, we're giving a certain amount of milliseconds of that power that we've programmed. So if I put in 10 joules to treat a patient, when I do, uh, let's say I'm going to put something out of a hat, if I give them 8 milliseconds of 10 joules, what you want is that energy level to be consistent and that they get 10 joules throughout the eight milliseconds. In other IPL systems, what happens is you get a big spike and then you get this downward thing. There is no way to have a very consistent uh, treatment. Then you can change the filters and then the sapphire chilled uh, plate is very important. And it's important for a lot of reasons. If you look at my earlier work before we had the M22, I would tell people you have to treat the patient and wait four to six weeks 
to give them their second treatment. The reason that you had to wait four to six weeks is if you don't have a chiller plate, you're actually burning epidermis. So you're burning that dead skin cell layer. You have to let that dead skin, that skin layer to regenerate before you give them their next treatment. With a chiller plate, you're not burning epidermis, so you can do a treatment every two weeks. So now we can get patients through their four treatment protocol uh, in two months. So we don't have to wait four months to see the effects of IPL for their dry eye. And that's because we have the chiller plate. So why not other systems? What they're doing, and uh, this actually makes me a little bit angry, is that they're taking these IPL systems that are about a $2,000 to $3,000 IPL system, putting a different shell on it, and selling it to you for 10 times what these IPL systems are worth. You can go on uh, uh, the internet, go on eBay, and you can get yourself exact same IPL system, maybe a little bit different shell, uh, for $1,000, $2,000. You know, IPL systems are just, if I just take some xenon gas, put it in a bulb, and then throw electricity through it, you can call that an IPL system. So that's why these IPL systems that are coming out now not are, are not doing the trick. And I could have told you that you show me the IPL system and I'll tell you whether that thing is going to work or not. And everything that I've seen out there, I was sitting there with Paris and we were just looking at all the IPL systems. And he said, hey, look at this one. I said, okay, well, this one is cooling with air. It's not cooling with a chiller plate. So it's not really cooling at all. You're going to be burning epidermis. This one, you can't control the energy levels. Uh, this one, they're saying you can control, you can uh, uh, treat around the lid margin, but what they're doing is they're only giving seven joules. That's not going to stimulate the meibomian glands. This one is saying, okay, well, we heat you a 540 filter and a 650 filter. Both of those are the, the wrong filters. So all these systems, again, it's if you're showing somebody that knows IPL, you just shake your head and go, no, this is not IPL for dry eye. So they don't have a chiller, decrease uh, energy with use. So one of the big problems with IPL is, again, in a simple IPL system that is not a larger, anytime somebody shows you a small IPL system, that means they only have so much xenon gas. And what happens to xenon gas is as you use it, the energy will, that you're getting from it will get less and less and less and less. So you'll treat a patient with 10 joules one day when you first get the machine, and then they'll come back, let's say two months later, you try to treat them at 10 joules, and the thing is only outputting, the technology is only outputting about seven joules, so you're not gonna get the same treatment level that you got the first time they came in. And that's why these other IPL systems have not been able to recreate their research studies because it's, they get a research study out of the box with 20 patients, yeah, it works, but let's follow those patients uh, for a couple of years. I actually, my first paper that I published, and I, wanted, and I did this on purpose, was a three-year retrospective showing that in three years these patients uh, do well and that we're getting consistent uh, results, not just a quick, these patients are doing well, 20 patients, and then, and then move on. We actually followed over 80 patients for three years with uh, their IPL treatments. Some of these systems, you can't control the energy levels. Uh, you lose the ability to treat different skin types because the, the main way that we control how different skin types, so you can treat somebody as dark as me and darker, is by the thermal relaxation time, the number of pulses, uh, but if you change anything else, so if you go below 10 joules, uh, those patients, their meibomian gland dysfunction is not going to go better get any better. If you go below six milliseconds, so there's a IPL system that says, oh, you can treat everybody, and how they do it is they go only two milliseconds of energy. Two milliseconds of energy is not enough energy to stimulate the meibomian glands uh, to work better. And why do I know this is because I've looked at all these, I've done this 20 years, we've been doing 20 years of research, I've looked at all of these energy levels, all of these wavelengths of light. And you'll see my patent here uh, in a bit. Uh, some, some of them charge you a click fee because you have to keep changing the bulb. Uh, other rollouts in different countries where these cheaper IPL systems have gone out have not worked very well. 
Uh, and so to achieve ad to uh, achieve no adverse events without a chiller, what they'll do is they'll just lower the energy, uh, or they will um, n not only lower the energy, but they'll decrease the pulse width, which is what I was talking about before with just the two seconds. Now, I know what a lot of doctors tell me is, I just want to treat dry eye, I don't want to do any of the aesthetic stuff. But actually, usually when the doctor tells me that and they get the M22, they usually will call me about six months to nine months later and say, hey, how do you do all this other stuff you do with the IPL system? So in our practice, in our aesthetics clinic, in our dry eye clinic, we turn on the IPL system in the morning and it's being used all day long. And what things is it being used on? It's, IPL is great for acne. Uh, so if you have teenagers that come in with acne or adults that have acne, they can get uh, IPL. We have three teenage daughters. They have acne. They come in, they get IPL every few months to decrease their acne. If a patient has rosacea, so they come in, they have full rosacea, you can program the machine to treat uh, their rosacea. It's great for facial rejuvenation. Now I've got patients that have been getting IPL for 20 years. They look a lot younger than what their age is. So I've got patients that have been getting IPL since they were 40. They come in now, they're 60. They don't even look 60. They look much younger than 60. Um, you can treat a hordeolum. So if you have a patient that comes in, not a chalazian, a hordeolum. So if a patient has a chalazian that's been there for a year and a half, IPL is not going to touch it. But if a patient comes in, they've got a hordeolum, you can push on it. Uh, and you may get a little bit of secretion in. You can treat them with IPL, and what we do is we treat them directly with IPL to the hordeolum. We give them a steroid antibiotic, and usually by three to four days, the hordeolum will be gone. So it's a great way to, we had, the best story I have on that, we had a woman that uh, came in, her wedding was Saturday, she had a big hordeolum like that on Monday. We treated her with IPL by Wednesday and Thursday. The hordeolum was gone, and she had a wonderful wedding. I wasn't invited, though, but she had a wonderful wedding. So I have, I've been studying these wavelengths of light and energy. I've been studying this for a while. I've got this patent. I have two other patents pending on all this information that uh, I'm giving you. So one of the things that is being touted right now by one of the IPL systems is this face mask. And they're using my research to tout this face mask. The reason why I was showing you how the penetration of light is is because the studies and the, the patents that we have is light on the epidermis going, LED light from the epidermis going to the meibomian glands. That's what works. If you have a face mask, that energy level and those wavelengths of light won't penetrate down to the meibomian glands. It might give you a little bit of facial uh, rejuvenation, but it's not going to do anything for meibomian gland dysfunction. If you want to use LEDs for meibomian gland dysfunction, you have to put it at the epidermis and that light has to go through. So we do have a uh, product that we're selling. It's called the Q. Uh, I'm going to be marketing it more and getting it out to other countries here pretty soon. So you're going to see this. But a face mask, if they sell you a face mask, that's not going to do anything. It'll just heat. It's like putting your face you know, on uh, the same thing that keeps French fries warm for uh, 30 minutes. So not. <laughs> that is not LED technology that we're talking about. And they use my papers to try to sell this thing. Face masks uh, don't work. And this was 10 years worth of research. This is the first LED that we used uh, for treatment. And then we started looking at different wavelengths. So this actually is one of the LEDs that we used that was actually blue light, infrared. Uh, infrared was here and red. And we tried all sorts of combinations red and blue, infrared, and we tried all sorts of different wavelengths. So for like an LED, you have to have a specific wavelength, it has to have a specific amount of joules, and you have to use it on the skin. A face mask is not going to work. Why do I know that is that we've tried several face masks, never gave us clinically significant uh, results. All right, I think they're going to be uh, uh, marketing a topographer called the Antares. Where I use these topographers like the Antares is uh, I think my, my biography is very important 
uh, to catalog dry eye disease. And so here's how I distinguish the different levels of meibomian gland dysfunction. A normal meibomian gland will be uh, straight up and down. Once your first stage of meibomian gland dysfunction, it will start to have a sausage-like appearance. So you'll get ridges in that meibomian gland. It'll still be straight, but you'll still see these ridges. So that's stage one of meibomian gland dysfunction. Stage two is the meibomian gland will start to take turns. So instead of being straight, the meibomian gland will start to take turns. Uh, stage three is the meibomian gland will be shorter. This is more of like stage three. Instead of a nice long meibomian gland, you're getting a meibomian gland that actually uh, is starting to drop out. And then the final stage of meibomian gland dysfunction is complete dropout. So what I do is we actually do mybography uh, on these patients. There was a good paper uh, a year ago in IOVS showing what happens to these patients with meibomian gland dysfunction and dropout is that the way the meibomian gland works, remember it's like a test tube, is that these cells are producing meibom and that meibom is going up. What starts to happen in dysfunction is you start to get this downward moving of the meibom in the meibomian gland till finally the gland becomes uh, completely filled with meibom. Nothing's coming up anymore. So the reason why I do meibomian gland expression is I want that flow to go up. And by uh, I use a, uh, you've seen it on video, a cotton tip applicator. I have another uh, applicator coming out. But we want to put pressure on the inferior portion of the meibomian gland and have that pressure start to make the flow of meibom to come up. The reason why I don't use expressors is if you look at the meibomian gland and it's a test tube, when you use the expressor, what you're doing is you're squeezing and you're actually leaving meibom on the bottom of the meibomian gland. You're not getting all of the my meibom that you can to get out. The other thing is when you do expressors, you're not getting that flow to go up. Uh, all you're doing is you're squeezing a portion of it and getting a little bit to come up. But what you want is constant pressure on the inferior portion of the meibomian gland so that you get flow of this secretion going up and you change the direction of flow. The other reason I like to use these typographers is that I like to get pictures of conchicolasis. Conchicolasis is huge. It's not really talked about a lot. But a lot of these patients are coming in and they've had long-standing inflammation. And what happens to their conjunctiva is it gets fluffy. And what happens when they're blinking, and this is why you see a lot of patients with meibomian gland dysfunction, that their outer meibomian glands are worse than their central. And the reason is, is when they're blinking, they're blinking on conjunctiva. Uh, so you're not getting any flow when you're getting blinking, and those patients will get impaction of the meibomian glands. So I like to categorize these uh, conchicolasis. Now what I tell people with IPL, if you have a young person with mild conchicolasis and you do IPL, if you decrease the inflammation that they're having on the eye, you can get this conchicolasis to go away. Um, but after you do, and I'd never do anything with conchicolasis uh, before I do IPL. After you do your four treatments of IPL and you get the meibomian glands working better and they still have this conchicolasis, you have to take it out. I've tried all sorts of surgeries to take away conchicolasis. I've tried grafts, uh, I've tried sutures. Uh, the best way is a technique I learned um, uh, from an Australian and an Italian doctor and I'll show you a video really quick. All we do is I give an injection of lidocaine with epi, blow up that conge, and what we're trying to do is go beneath the lid margin where that conge is, put it together, and then we're just cauterizing uh, the conge. These patients heal after about two days. They don't feel any soreness if you get it underneath the lid margin. And this is what they look like cosmetically. One of the things I don't like about grafts is cosmetically they don't look as good. But this is a patient one year after conchicolasis surgery like this. 
And then you could see that they don't have that uh, rigid margin of conjunctiva hanging so that when they're blinking, they're blinking gland to gland and not uh, on just conjunctalasis. This is easy. Once I do this uh, treatment, I just give them a little steroid antibiotic, patch them. They take off the patch the next morning, and then they start steroid antibiotic drops for about seven days, and then that's it. One of the reasons why I didn't like stitches is patients would complain about the stitch, and they would complain for about two weeks. So uh, this was uh, much easier. The other thing in this technique that I would tell you is make sure you're grabbing tenons uh, with it. So make sure when you do that injection that you're getting tenons and conj, and then you're grabbing both and doing the cauterization. So I've been doing this now for about six years. Uh, best way to take care of uh, conj cholesis that's not going away after you treat meibomi gland dysfunction. So the important papers, I'm just going to go over, I think this is right now the number one paper in terms of information that you can have uh, on intense pulse light with the M22 is that we looked at could we decrease the specific inflammatory mediators for dry eye, which is interleukin-17 and interleukin-6, and we showed uh, with sham versus IPL and three treatments doing ELISA immunoassay that we could cl clinically significantly decrease the amount of interleukin-17 in these patients with dry eye. They had improvement in tear breakup time and they also had improvement of symptoms. Hands down, best paper right now. Now I'm always asked about the upper lid. Uh, can we treat the upper lid? If you look at all my videos, we're treating the lower lid. I've tried for years. I've four studies before this one treating the upper lid. The problem with the upper lid, and this is why you can't do it with these other generation IPL systems, is when you're treating these patients with IPL, what's happening is that energy is dispersing. That's part of thermal relaxation time. So when I treat here, and then I go to the next spot, what's happening in that area that I treat is that thermal relaxation and that energy is dissipating. Very easy to do that in the lower lid because you can go, and that energy can go to the upper lid, it can go down, it can go sideways. The problem with the upper lid is that one, the area that you're working in is very small, and the other is the orbital rim stops this uh, dispensation of heat and thermal relaxation that you need. So what we would have to do in all these studies is lower and lower and lower the energy. That's why I know if you do less than 10 joules on the lid margin, you're not going to get any meibomian gland uh, improvement. So giving seven joules is not the way to treat these patients. So how did we finally come up with a way to treat the upper lid? Is by making the head smaller uh, that can go in the lid margin. You have that in the system, and I can show you how to use it. And I think the future will be even a smaller uh, uh, tip to use so that you can use on the upper lid. But you do have in the system now, and I can show you how to do that, a way to treat the upper lid. I only treat about 10% of patients uh, with IPL on the upper lid. The only patients that I treat in the upper lid are the ones that have my bone gland dysfunction uh, that is severe in the upper lid. What you'll see in a lot of these patients is the upper lid is not as bad as the lower lid. When you're treating the lower lid, you are getting energy up into the upper lid, and you can do expression. I do expression of the lower lid and the upper lid each time. So Luminous has support for what you're doing. They have brochures, they have videos, they, um, uh, they have training videos, they have things for your patients to read about. Uh, you patient brochures, posters, uh, animations on IPL uh, for your patients. So you can get all these marketing tools, digital marketing tools. Uh, we're doing a lot on social media. So patients will know that the technology that they're getting and the treatment that they're getting is better. I actually get uh, probably about 10 to 12 either social media hits or emails from patients asking me, where do I go to get treatment? Uh, what's the best? Right now we have a person who's dedicated to answering uh, all those emails. It's the reason why we opened a clinic in New York City is that we're getting so many East Coast 
people and New Yorkers who are asking, hey, I, w I want this treatment, I want this treatment. So if you get the system, believe me, you're gonna, one, you're gonna find these patients in your practice, but two, they will reach out to you for the treatment. Because we've had European patients that will fly out to wherever I am uh, to do the treat, to get the treatment. All right, this is an interesting study. So I was saying I was doing younger and younger patients. This is a patient that came to us. She was 10 years old at the time. She had seen five other ophthalmologists. This is as much as she could open her eyes. She hadn't gone to school in three months. So you could see, look, just walking in the door, you could see that this patient has uh, inflammation of the skin. So she had acne rosacea and she also had ocular rosacea. This is one week after one treatment of uh, IPL. So you can see the inflammation on her skin is down, but the inflammation on her eye uh, is down, and she was able to open her eye. She comes to our practice once a year. This is her now at uh, 18. She's probably 19 now. And you can still see, I mean, she does have this, this problem, but she no longer has this problem where she uh, can't open her eyes. What's very interesting is that she had ocular rosacea with, uh, with uh, blood vessels and panis going up to the central cornea. In these years that I've been treating her and decreasing the inflammation on her eye, these vessels have regressed. So when I first saw her, I was thinking, okay, this person's going to need a cornea transplant at some point. But that hasn't turned out. It actually, if you decrease the inflammation on the eye, you can make this ocular rosacea regress. I, we're improving our cataract and LASIK results uh, with uh, IPL. I don't know, the, there's music going, but uh, let me stop that. That was for social media. Um, but we're improving our cataract and LASIK results by one, diagnosing these patients with dry eye before they have surgery. Uh, and two, if they have dry eye after surgery, treating uh, these patients. So our treatment protocol is right now is I give these patients, if they fail a dry eye test, either by mybography or tear breakup time, we go ahead and give them two treatments of IPL. So we give them one treatment of IPL, we wait two weeks, give them a second treatment, bring them back a week later, we, and do the surgery. If we think the scans are abnormal, like the topography is abnormal, we will bring them back for tests uh, before we do the surgery. But it, they only have to wait uh, about three weeks for their surgery. So if you have a dry eye patient, don't just do the surgery. Go ahead and treat them with IPL. You can get this done and you can get two treatments in within three weeks and have them back in surgery. Our wait time in between surgeries is two weeks anyway, so another week is not a bad uh, wait time. If they, after surgery, if they have dry eye, I wait at least a month before I give them another IPL treatment. So you can wait a month and then give them an IPL treatment. Why do we pick a month? Uh, I just didn't want any heat or any uh, confounding factors uh, after surgery. The other thing is, I told you that this decreases, you know, endophthalmitis is not a huge uh, problem but this may decrease any kind of endophthalmitis because you can decrease the amount of bacteria on the lid margin. So if a patient comes in with blepharitis, that's another patient that we will hit them with IPL before they have surgery. A lot of this stuff and more is in that book uh, that you can get on Amazon. And then you can always reach me by email or on social media. I'm on all these platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, WeChat, or email me. Um, and I usually respond pretty quick. I respond quicker to social media than I actually on my email. So if you have a patient at your, uh, on your bed and you have some questions, uh, send me something on social media and I'll get right back to you.